worry. The monarch will explain all. Hello, son. Hello. It's been a while. Dad? Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Invincible Season 2, Episode 3 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs, WTF moments, a bunch of big characters coming back into the story, too, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. A lot of you probably recognize the voice. It is Peter Cullen from Transformers and like a billion other things doing the voice. All I could think was Optimus Prime just leading the coalition here. You warn the Earth Champion that a Viltrumite lives among his people? Fine. One shall stand, one shall fall. Big reminder that next week, episode four, is like the mid-season finale. They'll go on like a short break, and then the other four episodes, like the rest of the four episodes, or part two of the season, whatever they call it, will be early next year sometime. They have not revealed when that's going to be. They'll probably release some season two, part two trailer that will have that information sometime after episode four airs. Whatever winds up happening, of course I'll do videos. Robert Kirkman also said that they'd already pretty much finished season three and were finishing special effects, like the actual animation job on it. So the whole goal from here on out is to do one season per year. But hopefully in season three, there won't be like a break in the middle of the season. They'll just do all eight episodes. Careful for spoilers from episode three. If you haven't seen it yet, we'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, obviously the big reveal at the end of the episode that, you know, spoiler alert, Omni-Man is back in the story, but that is right out of the comics. Don't worry, we'll get to that. There's so much to talk about. Just starting with the title, This Missive, This Machination, which is a reference to like the fake in-universe Alan the Alien episode they did. It got super meta with the titles and the way they broke the episodes down into the two different types of episodes this week. Like they did a fake in-universe Alan the Alien episode just to show you what's going on with him, the Coalition of Planets, set up the Thetis character. That's also a big deal too. There's like a lot of lore, like a lot of info dumps that they did during this episode to explain characters' backstories and some of the backstory of the Coalition of Planets. Not everything, but like a little bit. The missive part is also a reference to Alan the Alien's mission that he was on, that he's coming back to tell them about what happened with Invincible. But also it's a reference to the Thraxon at the end of the episode where he brings this missive to Invincible, like you have to come to our planet Thraxo. There are billions of people's lives that are threatened when really it's just a ruse and Omni-Man is using him for a secret plot. Like it's not a sinister plot, but it is a plot that I'll explain when we get to that part of the episode. They won't really reveal the truth about why Omni-Man summoned his son under false pretenses until episode four. But his secret reason for doing that is where they get into the whole machinations part of the title of the episode. Also the idea that there's a mole inside the coalition of planets informing the Viltrumites what they're doing. That part of the episode is not from the comics, like this whole subplot within the coalition of planets. Like the coalition is a big part of the comics, but it's a much smaller part of the comics than they're making on the TV show. I explained this during my episode one video a couple weeks ago, but the idea is that because they're hour long episodes and they want to do like seven or eight seasons, in order to fill all that time, they're adding a bunch of side stories for characters that didn't necessarily get big stories in the comics. For instance, his mother's storyline with the whole survivor support group of superhero spouses, like that was not part of the comics. All the stuff with Amber, a lot of the college stuff, that was not part of the comics. But they start the opening scene with his mother dropping him off for his first week of college. They do make a joke about this at the end of the episode too. Like you're asking me to go off planet and I haven't even started my first class yet. The whole metaphor about pushing baby birds out of nests, him being able to fly, also reminded me of the boys TV show where Homelander tried to teach Ryan how to fly and wound up pushing him literally off the roof. <laughs> That was some quality 80s dad parenting right there. Both of them address that they're still in the middle of grieving for what happened with Omni-Man trying to deal with that to set up the big WTF reveal at the end of the episode. Like, wait a minute, dad, you're back. And also all the drama that Debbie goes through in this episode. Mostly though, it's for that big WTF reaction at the end of the episode, just to make it hit a little bit harder. Like they keep reminding you about Omni-Man Spectre. Like he's still alive. He's out there somewhere. He didn't die. He just took off because literally we see where that other place he went is at the end of the episode. His mother also reminds him as he's starting college to try and figure out who he is outside of being invincible. There are a couple of jokes about this at the end of the episode too, where he tells the Thrax, I'm like, no, 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 I'm in my costume. You have to use my secret code name, Invincible. You can't call me Mark Grayson. Omni-Man's real name is Nolan. That's what most of the other Viltrumites know him as. Omni-Man is the fake name that he created for himself when he created the superhero persona when he first came to Earth. 
This whole idea of identity, we'll also get into Omni-Man's real backstory. They kind of tease that during season one, like he told a little bit of his backstory, but we actually get into that in future seasons. Even though the title of the show is Invincible, obviously Invincible is the main character, a big part of the show is the redemption of Omni-Man, and we're going to start seeing that by episode four. And while they're sort of developing that backstory, like he's sort of processing his own history as a Viltrumite, like remember Omni-Man is very, very old you start to get more of the details of his actual backstory. There's a lot of secrets that they get into, like things about Omni-Man's backstory that he himself does not know yet. It's all in the comics, but it is kind of spoilery, so we won't get too deep into that during this video, but we will talk about it in future episodes when they do start covering that stuff. A lot of that gets into the whole Thetis storyline too. There's a lot, a lot of stuff going on there that they just barely tease in this episode. Seriously, it is like tip of the iceberg with some of these characters in these places they just introduced. When they joke about not doing drugs, Mark is correct in thinking that they wouldn't really work on him because of his superhero physiology, his Viltrumite physiology, unless he did every drug on the face of the planet, and even then it would only slow him down for a little while until he healed that damage. The only known compound that's actually lethal to Viltrumites is the Scourge virus. They don't really get into that too much during this episode. There are a couple teasers, like a couple characters reference Scourge, quote unquote, just to set that up. So we will talk more about the actual Scourge virus in future episodes. It sounds like they'll get into that a little bit more in the future of the season. Debbie calls the number on the help card that Olga gave her. The person she's speaking with is named Carol, the leader of the superhero support group. She's played by Leah Thompson in real life. There are like a lot of celebrity guest stars during this episode, but generally there's a lot of celebrity guest stars in all the Invincible episodes. Robert Kirkman just must have a ton of famous friends that are just willing to come do the show for him. The Seance Dog poster you might have detected is a Doctor Strange Marvel parody inside the Invincible universe. It is a character from the comics. He actually used to be called Science Dog, but for whatever reason, there was like some other character out there that had the copyright to the Science Dog name, so Robert Kirkman had to change the name to Seance Dog. Looking around their room, you notice William's got posters of the Magnum P.I. TV show, which seems like a weird deep cut poster to have in your college bedroom. Lady Yaya is obviously a Lady Gaga parody. DTF should be a very obvious reference. I shouldn't have to explain that. Lil Boss is probably a Lil Nas reference. The W above his bed felt a little bit weird though. Like that's a little bit on the nose. They do all the jokes about the trope of the sock on the door. That's an old trope of college movies. Dudes getting it on, keeping their roommates out without literally having to write it on the sign. Like, please stay out. I'm getting it on. I feel like everybody has either experienced this in real life or like a version of it or seen it in the movie. This bit has been around forever, but there was some writer for this episode having a little bit of fun because William's joke about eating tacos could be taken in a number of different ways. It means go eat a taco or fly to Spain or do whatever you have to do. Like go out and eat someone else's taco for a little while or just eat a regular taco at a restaurant. And speaking of which, there was a lot of taco eating going on in this episode. They even had Paul F. Tompkins, who was like the voice of the narrator in the episode, super meta, also joking about it. Like, oh, they're getting it on too. Okay, well, why don't we just talk about this alien cat for a little while? Um, uh, aha, here we find the Unopen feline. Everybody in the Invincible Universe is super horny on Maine. They make a bunch of jokes about Mark being an adult toy collector. There are literally hundreds of YouTube channels dedicated to adult toy collecting, so no shame there. I myself still quote unquote collect stuff every once in a while. Notice his box of toys has Seance Dog because they use that later in the episode for a couple of twists. The eye might be a reference to Marvel's Shuma Gorith. The robot seems like a Robocop reference. The green soldier seems like a G.I. Joe. Not sure about the yellow robot, maybe like a Transformers reference. Love that he gets super self-conscious, tries to dump them all, but not Seance Dog. Like, can't throw away his Seance Dog. Oh, sorry, buddy. Probably to set up the twist later in the episode where he's speaking to the Thraxen who's pretending to be Seance Dog. They pay off the joke with the sock on the door to set up him getting it on with Amber, also reminding you that they made fun of him in previous episode for being a virgin still. So Mark is basically losing his V-card in this episode. Everybody give him a round of applause. Probably the most notable thing here with all these jokes about them getting it on is that Mark very clearly has zero game despite basically being the most powerful person on the planet. Like he's fiddling with his little seance dog toy when she's like, okay, let's get it on right now. They make a bunch of jokes about the physics of superheroes having sex, like Viltrumites getting it on. Part of this is meant to flow with the whole storyline of Viltrumites interbreeding with other races in Omni-Man's new family on Thraxa. 
But in reality, because of their superior biology, essentially Viltrumites are compatible with most humanoid races in the galaxy, like they can crossbreed with pretty much any humanoid race. He turns off the lights at super speed and like his arm didn't grow, like he literally just crawled out from under her at super speed, turned the light up, then crawled back under her so quickly that she didn't even notice. That's also to remind you how fast he is even at his power levels, and remember, he's not nearly as powerful as Omni-Man yet. So he's only gonna get faster, only gonna get stronger. Like I said, the narrator is Paul F. Tompkins. He's not a character from the comics, this is just some weird meta bit that they did for the episode. But I do like the idea that there's like some secret super powerful being in a higher dimension watching this all play out, just commenting on it like he's watching a TV show. And he basically serves to tee up the origin story of Alan the Alien and the Coalition of Planets with the title of the episode flashing on screen. He basically does a speedrun version of Alan's backstory. It's right out of the comics. He was originally from a planet called Unopa before the Scourge virus was created when Viltrumites are still attacking planets en masse, like a big army of them would go planet to planet and conquer that way. They laid waste to their planet, but some of them eventually wound up escaping. They created a colony where they tried to create super soldiers, and Alan the Alien was the only successful attempt. There are a couple special powers that they tease during the episode that Alan has that he didn't know that he has. I'll get to that in a second when we get to that part. It's meant to play into the whole subplot about there being a lot of sus characters with secret plots in play. During the flashback where the Viltrumites are attacking Unopa, I think this one with the mustache is meant to be like a young version of Omni-Man. Remember, they live for a very, very long time, so this happened to their planet a long, long time ago. The powerful galactic attention that the narrator references is the Coalition of Planets. It's basically the Invincible Universe version of the Federation of Planets from Star Trek. Thetis inducts the Unopans to the Coalition, brings them to the capital of Telescria, and they also use this to set up the rest of the episode in present day with Alan coming back. Basically, the Coalition is just a group of planets that band together that hate the Viltrumites and want to stop them, led by Thetis. When Thetis calls the Viltrumites a scourge to the universe, that's also a reference to the Scourge virus. Maybe they'll start teasing that in either next week's episode or like the second half of the season. It's still pretty early because there's a bunch of Viltrumite related story that we probably won't get into like season three. They get into more of Alan's backstory saying that they tested him by setting him directly against Viltrumites, but it was unsuccessful. Like he got his ass pounded to him. So they set him on a mission to just go around the rest of the universe looking for other people that were super powerful and could help them fight the Viltrumites. That's how he ultimately wound up meeting Invincible. They make a couple jokes in the episode about how he made the dumb joke, the spelling error that put him at Earth instead of Urath. And they give the narrator, Paul F. Tompkins, the invincible title trope in this episode, where he almost says the title, but then it flashes on screen. But they also do the meta thing of turning it into the Alan the Alien title. The actual blood that flashes on the screen is meant to be Alan's blood. Mostly to reference the end of his part of the episode, where the Viltrumites also beat the crap out of him again. He winds up traveling back to Telescria, the Capitol building, and the idea is that this scene is meant to be taking place in the past right after the end of season one. So right after he got done talking to Invincible, he flew right back to the Coalition of Planets. So this is taking place maybe like a couple months in the past. He's met by General Telia, who's also voiced by Tatiana Maslany, who also voiced the Queen of the Atlanteans in last week's episode. Telia is Alan's girlfriend from the comic. She's another powerful member of the Coalition. The whole side plot where she talks about the Acreon planet being hit by the Viltrumites in this secret informer inside the council, that's all brand new. That was not part of the comics. Like I said, that's part of the idea where they're trying to expand storylines, like give characters more story that they didn't get in the comics because they're trying to fill more time. But basically the idea is the Viltrumites are going after all the worlds right after they join the Coalition of Planets, also turning off other potential members that want to join or would have joined otherwise basically cutting off the Coalition from more support, keeping it hampered so that they never grow powerful enough to challenge the Viltrumites. When Alan addresses the Council, notice that there's a member of Battle Beast's race on the Council because they're so powerful. Battle Beast is meant to be kind of like a parody of Mongol from DC Comics. Then he reveals everything that happened with Omni-Man in Invincible to Thetis. There's a bunch, a bunch of future storyline and secrets with Thetis' backstory. I don't want to get too much into that because it is kind of spoilery. But let's just say that Thetis was surprised in this episode about the existence of the Invincible character because of the way the Viltrumites have changed their tactics. Without explaining too much about how he knew the old Viltrumite tactics, the idea is the Viltrumites in present day under the leadership of Thrag basically changed their tactics for conquering the universe to basically get around the problem of the Scourge virus. 
The whole idea is that their race used to go around conquering planets the old-fashioned way with like a giant fleet, like they destroy a planet, take it over. But then the Scourge virus almost wiped out their entire race, reducing their numbers to a fraction. Then they started their special plan, like their stealth plan for conquering the universe one planet at a time by basically having their members go out and interbreed with the locals. They'd wait for their half-breed son or daughter to mature, get their powers, and then use them to take over that planet. And that's how they would take over the universe the slow way round one planet at a time. So I think Thetis reacting in such a surprise way at the knowledge that Invincible even exists, like, wow, why would they interbreed with somebody? is because they want to say within the context of the TV show, Thrag just started this side, you know, stealth plan for conquering the universe recently, like it's a brand new thing. Otherwise, Thetis probably would have figured out what the Viltrumites were doing a long time ago. When he mentions Viltrumites fighting other Viltrumites not happening since the Great Purge, that's what we saw in the flashbacks during Season 1 when Omni-Man was revealing the true history of their race. Like, they fought a brutal civil war to cleanse all weaknesses from their race, leaving only the strongest alive. So the fact that Thetis knows about the history of the Viltrumites and seemed keenly aware of the Great Purge, like he kind of strokes his beard a little and looks sideways, that should be a hint to you. If you've not read the comics, you can actually go read about Thetis' backstory right now if you want. But the whole idea is that now Thetis believes that he has two potential Viltrumites that can help them fight the rest of the Viltrumites in Thrag. The whole idea that Omni-Man abandoned his mission, which Viltrumites never do, in the fact that the son, who is also a Viltrumite now, turned against his father. So, like, potentially two that do not follow the Viltrumite ways. Then all the talk about the Viltrumites believing in racial purity is part of the old ways before the Scourge virus almost completely wiped them out. Afterwards, they used the interbreeding program to both conquer the universe the slow way, but they also learned that the half-breeds were less susceptible to the Scourge virus than the purebloods. So it was a way to, one, replenish their numbers way faster, but also to sort of sidestep the Scourge virus. This is also part of the reason why Mark, Invincible, is capable of becoming stronger than all Viltrumites, because he is a half-breed. So the whole concept of introducing other races' gene pools into their own, theoretically, making them an even stronger race. Omni-Man also kind of explained this like a hand-wavy kind of way during Season 1, like very briefly, basically saying that Viltrumite blood, essentially, Viltrumite genes are so powerful that they overpower the other genes in someone's body. So most of Mark's blood is Viltrumite blood. They said that the whole subplot about the Viltrumite informant on the council, this wasn't a big part of the comics, like I said. I think they're using this story on the show so that Alan the Alien will find the informant and it'll be a big reveal like, aha, you're informing the Viltrumites on us but also to set up the reveal about who Thetis really is, too. Like, he thinks he found the mole, but there's also an even bigger secret in what's going on with Thetis. Then they get super horny, like everybody on all the different planets everywhere start getting it on all at the same time. Probably the horniest episode of Invincible so far. Don't worry, because they will probably get hornier than this in future episodes. Afterwards, when they're eating at the diner, I love the whole joke here, too, about their gross food. She thinks that his grub creatures are gross just on their own, but she's eating the brains of a creature out of its skull while it's still alive and also at the same time eating those same grubs. They're giving the Telia character way more scenes that weren't in the original comic. Like, they were just girlfriend, boyfriend in the comics, but I think they're expanding on this because, one, they have Tatiana Maslany. She's a pretty big actress, but like I said, they're trying to turn some of these side characters into bigger stories just to fill out more episodes. Alan gets jacked by three Viltrumites. Remember, he wasn't powerful enough to stop one of them, so three of them he has absolutely no chance against. Notice they're familiar with him, so they don't even bother to move their lips. They just think their thoughts, and he's telepathic, so he just picks them up. All three of these Viltrumites are from the comics. Two of them eventually do wind up tracking down Omni-Man and Invincible on Thraxa. That might be during the events of Episode 4. You might also remember this same female Viltrumite from the flashbacks in Season 1. Remember, they live for a very, very long time. This one right next to her is Conquest. He's also a huge character from the comics, maybe by Season 3. I'm not expecting him in Season 2. Notice they know everything about Invincible and Omni-Man, and Alan had not yet told his girlfriend, Telia. I think to let you know that his girlfriend was not the informant. It's probably going to wind up being either one of the other council members or one of those two data analysts that he gave the same information to before he went to the council, because they'd have access to all that same information too. They beat him within an inch of his life, but he can heal the damage though. Don't worry, we'll get to that in a second, because there's a big WTF cliffhanger that they leave his episode on. The real reason why Thetis seemingly deactivates his healing chamber is a big misdirect. They, they just want you to think that he's sus, when really it's part of how Alan's powers work in the comics. 
his body will heal the damage and it's kind of like a doomsday DC comics parody. Anytime doomsday gets killed or hurt really badly, he'll heal the damage but he'll come back even stronger. It's the same phenomenon with Alan the alien. So once his body eventually heals the damage, he'll be almost as powerful as the Viltrumites, whereas he wasn't even close before. Thetis is basically turning off his stasis chamber to jumpstart that process. So he's not trying to hurt him because he wants him dead, he just wants him to heal even faster knowing how his powers work. Then they slam to the credits in like a super meta way to make you think like the episode is over. Let me know how many of you that were watching this actually thought that the full episode was over here when the credits started playing like wait a minute it's only 30 minutes long like what happened to the other 30 minutes? They get super meta so like when they jump back to the normal part of the episode with the Guardians of the Globe you actually start hearing duplicates breath as she's lifting weights as the credits are still playing so that you know that the episode is still going. There are probably a couple people out there though that turned the episode off like well I guess that's the end of the episode wait till next week. They go back to the Guardians of the Globe in present day and just remind you about duplicates powers like the whole idea is that anything that one of them does the others also feel like the main body feels anything the duplicates do including dying which he references later. So like only one of them here needs to actually work out the others will get the benefit. They also show you her absorbing her duplicates we haven't seen very often on the show and basically remind you that she's essentially died many many times like hundreds of times because her duplicates have been destroyed many times in battles. So she's known what it's like to die many many times like the immortal who's also literally died many many times and then just been brought back because of his powers. You also remember that she has a brother who was in prison in episode one. We'll probably see him come back at some point during the season. He basically has the exact same powers. They got their powers because of a curse that one of their ancestors got. They set up the monster girl and robot storyline where she jokes about why Rex doesn't understand the deep connection that Duplicate and Immortal have. Like she has the same connection with robot because they both live in kind of cursed bodies so to speak. Like they both been cursed by their biology in different ways. Like hers is because of an actual curse. Robot's body is basically just him getting the poor luck of the draw when he was born. They also remind you that Monster Girl has knocked the hell out of Rex. That was back during season one. There are a couple more jokes with Shavesmith just being super weird, not quite fitting in. I think just to tease the fact that they'll learn about where he really comes from, who he really is pretty soon. They tease Monster Girl and Robot's relationship. They go to the movies. Like they have that whole joke about how she basically has to pay someone else to get them tickets because they're not old enough to get into a rated R movie. That's more of a phenomenon in the United States. Every country has sort of like a similar rating system where like only adults are allowed to see certain kinds of movies or you have to have parental supervision. She basically reminds Robot that she's had to do this several times before because of the way her curse works like she's looked like a little kid for a long time now so she's learned the ropes of how to get around while she's looking like a little kid. All the movies here are just parodies of generic horror movies like Midnight Slaughter, Ritual Feline, Cobra's Alloy Cog. Senior Loop feels like a very specific meta joke about old people being on loops. All the posters are meant to be like generic horror posters like The Wolfman in Dracula for instance. She also starts to realize that Robot hasn't really done anything that normal kids did because his whole life like his entire childhood was spent inside a stasis tube. Literally the sun would burn his skin. So she takes him to Burger Mart like the same Burger Mart that everybody on the show goes to. It's a really big city but somehow they all wind up at the exact same Burger Mart so maybe it's burgers are just that good. They set up the whole superhero support group for Debbie basically the spouses of superheroes. Theo's played by David Diggs. We find out that he used to be the husband of Green Ghost who's a Green Lantern parody from DC and was killed by Omni-Man during the events of episode one. Kind of a downer ending for that storyline because he basically runs her out of the group like you better not come back it won't be safe for you implying that he is going to do her some violence if she comes back. I think a lot of that ending for that storyline too where she's like oh I wish he was dead but he's not he's out there somewhere is just to set up that big WTF reveal at the end of the episode where we actually do see where that other place he went is. All the Debbie stuff like I said is not from the original comics It's just part of her expanded storyline this season. We go back to college and they remind us about William's boyfriend who was turned into a reanimate last season. Cecil saying that he'll be fine soon might be a misdirect like we'll see because those alterations to his body seem pretty permanent. Then we get the big Thraxans reveal with the seance dog like it's basically a Thraxan pretending to be seance dog using his powers and he's voiced by Rob Delaney from Deadpool 2. Peter from Deadpool 2 basically. When he says the journey to Earth from Thraxa has taken most of his life, that's because they have ultra short lifespans, not much longer than a week or two. Like almost his entire life winds up being about six days. 
some of the stuff he tells to Invincible is true, and some of it is obviously a bold-faced lie. Like when he says the rest of the universe has started hearing rumors about your existence, that's not totally a lie. Like, people have started to learn about it. But all the stuff about saving his race from the meteor showers, that's a huge lie. He's there secretly on Omni-Man's orders to bring him back so that he can start to atone for what he did, and also set up something that they're going to pay off in Episode 4 with Omni-Man's new family on this other planet. My early theory right now they'll pay this off in episode 4 is that the Viltrumites who were looking for Omni-Man's whereabouts, that's why they almost killed Alan the alien. Omni-Man will realize that the Viltrumites are going to come for him and he wants to save the life of his new son, Invincible's half-brother, so that's why he called and they're like, please take your half-brother back to Earth with you to protect him from the other Viltrumites. Thus begins the redemption of Omni-Man and probably a really big Viltrumite battle during episode 4 as sort of like a mid-season cliffhanger. Like I said, Omni-Man is like a big, big part of the story for like the rest of what the show is going to be. When William references the last time that he was reluctant to help save someone, he's talking about an Invincible not saving his boyfriend until it was too late, until after he'd been turned into a reanimator. Then the clue that Thraxon was lying to him about who he was, what his mission was, should be that he knows Mark Grayson is his full name. He shouldn't know that. They also tease more friction between him and Cecil because he defies his orders leaving the planet. That will only continue to get worse. Remember, Cecil's been developing all these contingency plans to fight Viltrumites behind the scenes. Even though Invincible is trying to be a good person, good superhero, protect the planet, at some point we will see him have to fight Cecil in some way. They have a couple jokes about the six days travel it's going to take to get to Thraxa and how he's going to survive all that boredom. But then they arrive and reveal the monarch is his father, Omni-Man. We'll talk a bunch more about what happened on Thraxa, like what Omni-Man did after he left Earth when we get to episode 4, so we have to wait that long. But if there are any other easter eggs or references that you spot in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My full episode 4 video will post next week. We also just got a What If Season 2 trailer video. Those episodes will be happening at the end of December. That'll be like the next big animated show that I do. Click here for that trailer and click here for all my other Invincible videos. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.